Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing, because we've got another month, we got another diary, so we're going to get one for the last month because we had the release of the uh, update 10, so that gave us the Grasslands pack with the Lasm Ethereum and all that, really, really cool. So we're going to have a look at March 2024 and this is actually quite a beefy one, so I'm really excited to get stuck into this one. So in, in this blog post, We'll be uh, detailing some of the things you may expect to see in Update 11 and talk about new game mechanics and more. So, before jumping into the bulk of our Update 11 coverage, we wanted to quickly touch base on a few things. So the first is that we're working on another recording session with the brilliant Nigel Marvin. Not only are we doing dialogue for the species that I currently lack it, we're also retroactively adding an introduction in fact for animals that are now an alternate genus, so things as Tarbosaurus, Charnosaurus, etc. And then it feels strange to say, but soon we'll have lines for almost every animal that we're planning to release in early access. So that'll be really, really awesome. So I think they mean different alternate species, not alternate genus. Well, it's Tarbosaurus, not genus. But yeah, that, that's what they'll be doing. So now uh, Tarbosaurus will have its own fact, which is really, really interesting. So um, that's cool as well. You can see recorded lines. You can see the introduction. Dunder uh, so, <laughs> you know, Brontosaurus. Talk about a bit of mythology with the Chinosaurus. Uh, in terms of as well, we've got secondly, they've revised the uh, American cave lion or the American lion and the cave lion space animations and fixed their stare. You can see, kind of looks like he's got no thoughts, head empty. Uh, but you can see that looks very much more like a typical lion or cat. So it looks really, really good. And we're not sure what horrors it might have experienced, but now the chillax cats or relaxed cats will be on their way to update uh, update eleven. And also you can buy the supporter bundle that came out March 5th. So if you missed out, it came out in early March and helps fund development and provide access to volume one of the digital art book and our soundtrack. So that's quite cool. I'm pretty proud of how they've turned out. And to just talk about more what comes with each of these, so you can see that comes in here. The art book provides a 200 page look at animal concepts, environmental renders, and concept sheets for hundreds of pieces available in the game, or offering insight for like development insight into our choices and why they are designed the way they are. And it's important that it was feel like it was just a picture box. So we've got here's an example here. So you're talking about Pachyrhinosaurus. Here's a note from Elizabeth who kind of gave it to myself a little look at the story. Also talks about the different species and how they differ from each other, and also a little bit of uh, talk about you know the kind of vibe of it because of this as a shaggy you know shaggy Pachyrhinosaurus and just why it came to be, which is quite interesting. So yeah, here's another one as well. So this is about design of more other things. So things like, uh, we'll see the donation boxes and going through the process of that. So it's another one there. So if you want to have a proper look at the 200 pages, you've got to buy that. And then they've also released the soundtrack, which features about 25 minutes of music and four exclusive uh, bonus tracks if purchased on Steam or Bandcamp. Uh, but the album is now available to buy now on Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, and pretty much any platform you prefer. But that's still really cool. A little bit of PSA, but now we're going to have a look at the in-development updates. So this is update 11. So in late April, we'll be rolling update 11 on our public testing branch on Steam, uh, where we can get feedback and continuously develop uh, this update. And this release is going to massively change how the game is played, and also important that we have uh, community feedback during that production. Uh, so that means we'll have a broad look at what's coming soon. So first up, we've got a new look at a new species. So update 11 will be introducing two new animals. So the first one is a squirrel-like dinosaur from Down Under. We've got Leal and Asora. So a really, really awesome dinosaur. You can see here, I love the skin as well. I love this pattern, really like mottled pattern with a bit of light yellows and darks and things like that. It looks really, really cool. So as uh, southern parts of Australia were located within the Antarctic Circle during the early Cretaceous, it's possible that sunlight would have been highly variable. So this animal would have potentially gone weeks without sunlight. We've chosen to highlight the various levels of cold tolerance Leelonosaurus uh, might have had through variants, uh, various uh, or varying lengths of plumage per skin. So you can see some are a little bit more fluffy, some are a little bit less fluffy. But unlike other small uh, herbivorous dinosaur pre and kick them, these ones actually have quite frightening, frightening dentition. So you can see here's another skin, a little more of a shaggy one. This one's also uh, not quite as shaggy. And this one's kind of a little bit leaner and meaner one. But I love the colors, like the purple and the red and the white. It's just a really, really nice one. Definitely a big fan. 
And now that leaves one unknown species for update 11. And before anyone rushes to speculate what it is, it is not another theropod. So we are quite lucky in that regard. And there's a little tease there. Um, um, in terms of species splitting, uh, going forward into update 11, all animals in the game will be properly split into their species in the UI. So that means you'll be in the nursery extractions. So uh, in the extraction menus, you find distinct buttons for each species, as a, rather than lumping them under one umbrella. And we'll also be extending this functionality to animal info and signs too. So you can see here you've got the mammothus. Now you can go P. atrox uh, or panthera, uh, panthera splayer, which is the cave in American lion, also fatalis and populata, the two different species of saber tooth cat. And you can see for alternate species as well, you've got Lasmotherium and Cyanotherium, and also Jurexia and things like that. So all the alternate species have been the kind of now not lumped together all their own thing. And as far as the game was concerned, each species was already considered unique, and it stands to make the UI consistent with that, which is also quite cool. And we'll also uh, reflect this upcoming change as well. They've actually updated the website's Animal Gallery too, and this will receive a new big UI overhaul. Uh, the nursery will receive a big UI overhaul down the line to better accommodate these changes, so of course, stay tuned for that. In terms of early staff logistics and gameplay, so as this, uh, this is a part of the dev diary, we're going to walk through what to expect from logistic, logistics and then overall gameplay loop as, present, as it presents. Uh, so and when update 11 comes we'll only have keepers and laborers available as they're the most essential uh, at the stage of development and then the remaining staff such as janitors editors uh, engineers security and vets will be added as gameplay systems become relevant so you can see these are the two ones going to be added keepers and laborers so starting out so as you begin to build your park you notice that feed uh, that feeders and kiosks are now empty when placed in order for them to actually work they must be stocked by staff members so that's where logistic gameplay comes in so to get resources into the zoo players will need to first build a loading bay and upon this initial first time placement players will receive an immediate shipment of goods to help get their park up and running after that the loading bay will continue to import guest meals merchandise and a small amount of animal feed every 15 minutes I'm not yet finalized, so it could be a bit longer, via a box truck. So players can purchase up to two additional box trucks into the loading bay to speed up delivery times, uh, and also to add additional loading bays if they need more shipments. That'll be quite cool. And you can see the UI there, it looks quite interesting. You can see all empty, uh, all the empty feeders, and you can see the loading bay here, which looks really, really cool. Definitely does fit the aesthetic. And this is a working UI, so it's going to look much nicer than it did before. So once your resources have arrived, players are going to need to transport them around the zoo. So laborers can carry the meals and merchandise to guest facilities, or keepers are needed to refill feeders with animal feed. So access the staff hiring menu. Pet players will need a staff center. But of course, just like any manual module, these new structures can be built over or recolored with the modular building system. Just ensure that the points of access, i.e. the doors, are still access. So you can see this is pretty much a basic one. But of course, because they're modules very similar to Planet Zoo, you'll be able to build your own, which is quite cool. Here's another look at the UI, so you can hire the staff. John Smith, John Smith, John Tordotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodotodot
experience, allowing logistics staff to move stock from the loading bay into their respective storage spaces. This means that if a feeder needs refilling and your restaurant needs more meals, staff can simply just travel to the nearest storage module and uh, get what they need rather than having to walk all the way back to the loading bay. So kind of they get your loading bay and then these guys will allow you to store it around the park, which is quite interesting. It's quite cool. So these warehouses are planned to have a few basic UI options that dictate how they sh they should be filled up. A uh, they store fruit uh, that has been delivered to this produce module, and you're aiming to make it more contextual. So a produce module near a meat feeder is naturally going to have more meat delivered to it than a produce feeder that's got meant for a herbivore paddock. So it's kind of going to be more intuitive, which is all cool. And that's a bit more theoretical though, but we're sharing how we'd like them to work. So they really want to make it be able, you know, the staff will be smart enough to store your meats with your meats, your veg with your veg, because zoos, that's very important. You want to make sure that you don't mix it too much. And diets are very important in zoos, of course, you've got to make it up. And a lot of them are very specific formulated diets. So you've got to be careful with that. So it'd be really, really cool to do that. I think that'll work quite well and so we don't just get random meats and stuff like that so putting them where they need to be i think is quite good so you smell that uh interesting so when animals eat they'll eventually excrete uh, with a out of place to, uh, to dump their dung, keepers can't keep habitats clean. That's why you need to invest in a couple uh, compost heaps modules. So you can see there's the poop. So these are moved by keepers and then you can see the compost heap kind of comes in there. So after cleaning up, you can see this is the uh, temporary visuals and then this is the design of it. You can see lots of piles of poo there. So after cleaning dung piles, keepers will transport uh, the poop from an habitat to the nearest compost heap. And once delivered, they'll be converted to compost over time. And that's a resource that will be invaluable when making your own animal feed. And this module does have a pretty negative impact on park beauty. So you wanna make sure that you keep these compost heaps away from the guests because they can smell, uh, <laughs> but interesting as well. So creating produce. So after a certain amount of park growth, the measly amount of animal feed that you get from the Lonely Bay isn't just going to cut it, it's not going to cut it. Thankfully, that's where the produce station can come in. With the produce stations, you'll be able to create food for your animals by converting the compost in your park into feed. And as long as the staff can keep delivering compost, you can keep making produce. So produce stations can be specialized to cultivate a specific type of food. So plants, fruit, meat, fish and insects. And, but can also produce all dietary types for lower yield per compost conversion. So compost basically means you can make more food. And you can have like different types in one, but it's going to be less. You can just devote one to just making meat or just making veg, and it allows you just variety. So you can have uh, you can have one that makes like meats, veg, and you know insects. You could have one, but they just mix it up. But you can de dedicate it to one. It just depends. In the event you have no storage modules, the keeper will ex ex uh, instead will take produce directly from the produce stations when going to refill feeders. So just add another one as well, but you can see that produce there. See lots of plants. This one's growing plants. Compost is running low, and you can see you can have your meat, your uh, your fruit, your veg, and you know your fruits, and then you can have you know your fish and insects. So that's quite cool. Another ex aspect to the diet really really interesting and you can see this one's uh, probably to make fish I believe you can see you've got the fish there and some meat so let's see you can, a bit of variety going on which is quite cool so in review this is the logistics so this is kind of the work that we do so loading bay that's where you port goods so then the laborer will transport them a good station which is like uh, merchandise and food things like that will store that there the laborer will take it to uh, obviously other guest amenities and then the guest amenities made the income and that's kind of the loop but with laborers making food the food will be transported to the zoo no, it's with the food it'll be taken to the habitat and then the habitats make poop and the poop will obviously be transported back to the keepers to put in the compost heap and the laborers will tra make compost to the produce station so it's all a big feedback loop and you can see it's quite well explained there but yeah, there has been some changes as well from the last January Dev Diary. So as a final side note, we'd like to mention that since the last, last Dev Diary, the plan for our general staff has changed. So we now intend for cashiers to simply be parts of the kiosk uh, modules and their upkeep costs, rather than being separate entities that can be hired slash fired, like keepers or laborers. So because of this change, the idea of janitors and laborers temporarily taking the job of other uh, people have been scrapped. So basically, that you'll just when you buy a kiosk, you'll get a uh, 
cache member as well. So this potentially makes the role of staff in the game a lot more clear cut and should make it more obvious when someone in the park isn't working. But not a huge change, but not enough to want to tell you. So more similar to Planet Zoo in that regard. So each kiosk or so each module that you make will kind of be, you know, that in that regard. Uh, so that's quite interesting. Quite cool. Some other changes as well. I actually want to actually, no, we won't worry about that at the moment. So gameplay changes, there's also some changes to excavations. So excavations are what allow prehistoric kingdom to bring extinct animals back to life, scaring the globe in search of viable genetic material. And uh, in the current game, however, the extractions uh, mechanic is nothing really more than a glorified shopping menu. And with update 11, we aim to rectify this. So this is the new system. So coming up to update 11, there's a brand new module, the Fossil Depot. Uh, which provides uh, this building provides space for the park's dig teams to go out and excavate, you know, and gain access to the menu. So in the uh, it is here that players will both buy and send out dig teams to various dig sites around the world, and these sites will be used to obtain the necessary DNA to create animals in the animal nursery. And any idle dig teams currently not excavating will uh, eventually be visible in the car park below. So that's quite interesting. So you can see this is what they're doing. This is the uh, module for the fossil depot. And then you can see the world around, you can see that's Hell Creek, but there's going to be, of course, uh, all sorts around the world. Morrison, da 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 da. Kind of very similar as, you know, uh, Jurassic, world, Jurassic Park Operation Genesis, things like that. So, uh, hovering, uh, by hovering across a, over a dig site, the, uh, the players will be able to see the potential operating costs of an excavation, the estimated time per ex uh, excavation cycle, and whether or not there are events impacting the dig site. So once uh, opened, up to about five dig teams can be assigned at once, including the ongoing operation costs in exchange for a higher dig uh, DNA yield each cycle. So that's kind of very similar to JPOC in that res in that regard. Um, so the more that you put, you can put the more dig teams in there and just get lots of DNA if you really want. But um, there is no financial penalty uh, penalty for moving teams from dig site to dig site, but they will have to travel back to the park first. So that's pretty interesting. In terms of uh, excavating, as you can see, ex each excavation cycle, your assigned teams will send their findings back to the park in the form of DNA. So you can see the DNA that you find there. So bring it back to the site. And the yield, the yield amount of DNA is random, but it can be improved by installing infrastructure at the dig site, such as housing, uh, which decreases total evacuation, uh, in total excavation time, and also their own personal genetics lab, and this improves the yields. So just different species will have their own yield rar rarities, so even if you decide to tackle Hell Creek from day one, it'll be unlikely you'll unlock a Tyrannosaurus before a Montosaurus. So some animals will be obviously harder to find DNA than others, so things like Montosaurus, you know, T-Rex, everyone will kind of have to take a while to find them. Uh, but once at 100% of the DNA has been found, you can now breed them in the animal nursery. And then completing all animals within a dig site will unassign the relative teams and then return them to the park, so that's quite good as well. And we've also got events. So everything we've discussed so far assumes that your excavations have gone smoothly though. Every month though, there are global events that randomly impact dig sites across the world, which is really cool. So there's positive and negative events, or just no events, just normal. So a positive event is like a fossil boom uh, uh, that can help send up excavation process that dramatically increase the yields uh, as long as the event is active at a dig site. And though others have uh, negative impacts such as high export tax that can increase your operating costs, excavation times and lower yields as your team struggles to send your excavated goods back to the park so you can see here so there's no event and no, no, nothing happens positive everything's all good and the negative events actually worsens it so things like you know high tax things like that which is quite interesting so you can see that kind of going on here and that's the ui that they're planning looks really really cool high end event so this, this one's positive you know everyone's happy you know lots of fossils this one's kind of bad though because there's a high export tax so that kind of makes it more expensive and all this UI as I mentioned is also kind of in progress. Players might need to pivot their excavations from month to month depending on how these conditions change, taking advantage of sudden opportunities or temporarily leaving a site behind 
and what may have been a great month of Howl Creek now might quickly turn out to be expensive crawl the next. So it makes it just much more interesting, I think. It's a really interesting gameplay loop, and I'm really excited to see how that comes out. So it's just more expanded than pretty much JPOG. It's very really similar to JPOG, but I think it's just more expanded with having different events and things like that to really make it, you know, unique, and you have to be, like, on your toes, constantly watching it, you know? There could be, a, like, a benefit that you need to take advantage of or try to take advantage of, and then you, there's a something that happens you know so if you're really in the sh in the um in the dark you know well, i wouldn't say i don't want to say the s word but uh, if you're really in the doo-doo you could say um that could be like the end of your park so it's, i think it really creates some interesting gameplay and i think it's quite cool so yeah i agree with that that's quite cool and i really like the produce as well so uh, I like the produce system because a lot of zoos try to, you know, make their own food, especially with insects because they're quite expensive. You try to have your own food, uh, try to find them. So, yeah, I think that's a cool system as well, especially since you have such a big dinosaurs. I think that'd be quite interesting, a really cool uh, way to include that. But, yeah, let's carry on. Next up, we have got the guest art overhaul. So moving on into a more stylized art direction, the future of the new area of, era of visitors to Prehistoric Kingdom is intended to include better faces, hair, clothing, new ethnicities, and an expressive suite of animations to make the park feel more alive. So you can see here's the kind of new um, uh, guest model, and you can see it does fit quite well with you know our hyper realistic, really really pretty animals. Definitely a big fan. You can see a great look at the uh, Apatosaurus there. I really really love it. And you can see some initial concepts. So these are female faces with different races and skins and colors and all that. And it looks pretty good. Definitely all right. Uh, definitely fits. And before you can see the work in progress animations we've been making, they're not all will be in game as of update 11. There are some technical issues to make the selfie work. Uh, we hope this shows the commitment to improving the quality of our humans. So there, yeah, that's cool. Some cool animations, you know. She comes up, you know, takes a picture, has a selfie. Pretty sort kingdom. I know we all want to do that. Here's another animation as well. Looking around, she's like, what the heck's going on? Uh-oh. And then this one, you know, see something really cool. Ooh, this is, reminds me so much of uh, Zoo Tycoon, you know, point to an animal they like, and you know, have a clap. That's really, really cool. And then Mesh Topography's done final, so they will be improving the eyeball, so don't worry about that. In terms of update 11, uh, there's planned to be the first stage of the guest art overhaul with it, focusing on upgrading our technical backend support to support these new visual features. And there'll be a lot of assets. There have been a lot of assets to design, model, and curate, but we are getting there. And we have more info about what guest features will be ready in update 11 once it hits public testing branch. And yes, we're working on bench sitting. So you can see she's going to sit on the bench there, chillaxing, having a good time. It's so quite cool. And then she gets up really really nice so before we're going to talk about a little about the future you know a little bit of a cheeky tease so the future we have some really cool ontogeny art tests so to close out this month's dev diary we'll leave you with a uh, work in progress on our baby tyrannosaurus it looks really really cute so we're expecting some proportions and face shapes to change before ontogeny is fully implemented and enter the game but it will at least give you an early look to how these fluff balls could look and you can even see it's a cute little baby it looks really really cute and uh, even you can even spot an adolescent there. So that one's much more based on Jane. So these are like a really, really young little babies. That one's a little bit more Jane-like. And this one is obviously a big adult T-Rex. But yeah, really, really cool. So a lot of dinosaurs, we do have a good idea of their endogeny. So it's really cool to be able to employ that and use that in the game. So that's going to be quite cool. So as... Uh, Mentioned previously, all baby skins are designed to blend into with their adult colors, regardless of what skin selected. In the case of our Tyrannosaurus, that means all Tyrannosaurus will start as actually feathered infants, or either lose feathers through maturation, so they'll grow up to a scaly skin like leather hide or something like that, or retrain them and then they'll grow up to be in a feathered skin. So we can't wait to share more uh, looks at Antogeny with you in the future, so that'll be quite cool. And there has been some edits, so there's quite more improved proportions. You can see this is a little bit nicer, I think. So this is an additional look at the Baby Rex with improved proportions. So since the ontogeny in prehistoric kingdom is seamless, infant animals cannot have a perfect one-to-one -one limb size to what's found in the fossil record. So we'll be doing our best to make the babies feel cute, but somewhat accurate without overly warping the models. So you can see this guy's really, really cute. I really love this guy. I love this model. I think this guy looks so much better than the picture there. You can see the changes. So that just looks like a little T-Rex, but you can see that changes 
really really fits perfectly really does look like a really nice little baby t-rex and i love the feathers really really cute so yeah that's a great place to end off the really cute baby t-rex so next up we're going to have a look at some community spotlights this is done by incognito we have got some uh, a spinosaurus chilling out and there's some birds picking on him uh, picking they're very similar to crocodiles you know, picking out all the bits between his teeth just chilling really really cool this one's done by S Assassin Spino. I really like this as well. You know, we got all these cute plushies. We got Dilophosaurus, uh, Cacarodontosaurus, uh, Dinochirus. Is I think that we have one here. Where is he? Uh, that's a Velociraptor. I think there's a Dinochirus somewhere. That one's I think is a Montosaurus. You know, really really cool different skins. All the leather hides. Really really awesome. And then we've got by Carlos Six uh, Seven G. This is using a lot more of the Stone Age and a more like rustic theme. That's come recently. It looks really, really nice. It's a really, really interesting one, especially using that Canada mat. So yeah, thank you for reading March Dev Diary. That was a lot to read this month, but we're hoping that you got through it okay. We'll be excited to share, um, to continue developing Update 11, and can't wait to share more once the uh, public testing branch version goes live. So uh, the PK team wants to thank you for that. My thoughts, pretty, pretty cool. I really love the additions. Like I can see a lot of those systems are pretty basic to most zoo games or most management games. Uh, like basic, the basic kind of uh, layout is this for the excavations is pretty much the same as J uh, JPOG, but it's been expanded and made much more interesting by you know the events. And I think that's really going to be um, those kind of things. I think it really makes for much more engaging gameplay. And I think, and the same with the produce as well. So you're actually going to have to manage what you actually put within your park. So I think this is really awesome that this game is trying to take much more of a management side. So I think a lot of games like Planet Zoo, you know, they're very creative and you like to create creative things. But there really, there's not much in terms of management. So I think that's really awesome that PK is really trying to get that management and create a really fun, engaging gameplay loop. Of managing a zoo especially when it be a dinosaur zoo so there's special things that you have to take into account that you won't have to account for a regular zoo so yeah really really cool definitely a big fan so i think this is a great place to end the video so i really 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 hope you guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe always work at the little bell icon to get notified for anything so yeah if you guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye